This is an I Am Listening original podcast. You're probably spending the most amount of money you're going to in your lifetime. Don't go with the cheapest person because you get what you pay for. And I think it's really important that you bear that in mind when making the decision as to who you instruct to do your conveyancing. Welcome to The Property Podcast with Wards and me, Gary Wilson, the monthly podcast where I'll share with you all the latest Kent property news, as well as speaking with industry professionals to offer advice and tips that will hopefully help make your house moving journey a little less stressful. This podcast is brought to you by Wards. As Kent's local independent estate agent, Wards utilise years of experience and expertise to promote your property in the best possible light to the largest possible audience. For more information, receive an online valuation in less than 30 seconds or book an in-person appraisal of your property with us today. Head over to wardsofkent.co.uk to find out more about our unique approach. In this, the fourth episode of the Property Podcast with Wards, we're taking a look at all things related to conveyancing with our special guest, Sarah Smith, partner solicitor at Bracers LLP based in Kent. Uh, thank you for joining us on the podcast. How are you? You're well? I'm very well, thank you. Good, good. Uh, now, uh, I used to think when I was younger that conveyancing and seancing was the same thing. I thought that conveyancing was when you sit around trying to speak to the spirit world. But conveyancing is not that. So let's find out about what you do, because it's one of those words you see when you buy a house for the first time, you're looking at property for the first time, you see it, and it's one of those words that's a bit scary. So what role does a conveyancer play in the property buying process, and uh, why is your expertise so important? Why do we need you? So a conveyancer is the legal property specialist who will act for you in the conveyancing process, whether you're buying or selling a property. At Bracious, we've got fully qualified solicitors and executives together with fantastic support team. The role of the conveyance is vital in the conveyancing process because they are the person that will actually transfer the legal ownership from one person to another. It's really important that you pick the right conveyancer for you as it's a really important decision. No matter what the estate agent tells you, you don't have to use their in-house service or any companies that are recommended by them. Don't make a decision based on the price you pay. Right. How would you give advice to someone to make that decision? Because obviously it's a big thing. It's a scary thing. You don't have, you know, it's not like buying things you've bought in the past before. You don't know, you know, compare this, compare with that. What would you say is the most important thing to go on when you're having that conversation? I would always say shop around, get some quotes, speak to the person that would be handling your transaction get to know them, feel comfortable with them, understand what experience they've got with the role. Also, remember that you're probably spending the most amount of money you're going to in your lifetime. Don't go with the cheapest person because you get what you pay for. And I think it's really important that you bear that in mind when making the decision as to who you instruct to do your conveyancing. So it does make a difference. A newer companies, let's say, less established, less connections, you can pay for that. You can do. There's a lot of conveyances online services where you can pay £300 for a conveyancing service. And if you're spending three, £400,000, it just doesn't ring true that something that cheap is going to be a good service. So speak to a person, make sure you've got the person who's qualified, wealth of experience, knows about the type of property you're buying that can really act for your best interest. So people need to be led through each process of buying and selling homes. So can you explain the key steps involved in the conveyancing part of things? You know, from start to finish, let's say I've arrived, here we go, what happens first and then how do we go through the whole thing? Absolutely. So obviously you will find a property via the estate agents and then you will have an offer accepted if you're buying or if you're a seller, you will accept an offer. You then need to get the conveyancer on board to do the legal work. So what you'll have to do is once you've found the solicitor that you want to instruct, they will onboard you as a client, which means they've got to do some checks on your ID, find out how you're paying for the property, source of funds, etc. They will then have you on board as a client Um, They will then ask you normally for some money on account to cover disbursements, things like searches, documents, etc. that they'll get from the land registry. 
We will then, as a conveyancer, contact the estate agents, the other conveyancers, let them know that you've instructed us, and then the actual process starts from there. So if we're acting for a seller, we will get a copy of their title from the land registry. We'll also ask you as a client to fill in some property forms. So that would be a property information form and a fittings and contents form. So the property information form just gives a lot of history about the property, whether you've had any building works done that needed planning permission, building regulation consent, whether you've had any disputes with neighbours, um, whether you've got any guarantees or warranties that relate to the property, just a real kind of comprehensive history of the property since you've owned it. The fittings and contents form is essentially what's in the property that you're going to leave behind or perhaps what you might consider selling to your buyer. And if you are going to sell them, what price you'd like to offer for them to, to buy that. Once you've done that, the solicitor acting on the sale will then draft the contract. They will send that what's called a draft contract package to the buyer's conveyancer with the title, with those forms for them to then review. If I were then acting for you as a buyer, once I've got that draft contract paper, I will submit searches, which cost about three to five hundred pounds, depending on what searches are needed. I will then go through the draft contract paper pack that I've received from the seller's conveyancer. I will go through the title, check there's any inquiries that I need to raise and raise them with the seller's conveyancer. As a seller, you would then expect to answer those questions. Um, as a buyer, at that point, you'll probably want to get a survey done. Obviously, very important to have a survey done. You're spending a lot of money on a property, so you need to check the structural integrity of the property is OK. You know, the surveyor will check the walls, the foundations, and they'll let you know if there's any major issues that need repair. That might then be there's something that you go back to the seller on to negotiate on price. If you're getting a mortgage, at that point, you will get a mortgage offer sent to your conveyancer. As conveyancers, we need to review that, check that, make sure all the details are correct, the property address, the name of the parties on the mortgage, the price of the property you're paying and any other special conditions that the lender might want us to verify. It's important to remember when you're buying with a mortgage that your conveyancer is acting for you as well as the mortgage company. So we have a duty to act for the mortgage company in their best interests. So it may be that we've got to report something that's been revealed through our investigation to the lender to get their approval before we proceed. So basically you, you make sure that everyone knows everything in all the disparate parts of the arrangements of what happens when you're buying and selling, you're you're kind of at the centre of the, the whole thing, really. We are. We've sort of got many hats, really. So yeah. we're acting for mortgage companies, for clients. We're keeping the estate agents involved. Um, as I said, we're obviously doing the searches, checking them for the client, reading through the survey once it's been done, just to make sure that there's nothing untoward about the property. And as a conveyancer, the key thing is if there is an issue, you need to pick it up quickly and to explain to your client what the issue is and how you can resolve it. So perhaps if there's a boundary dispute or something like that, you might we might need to speak to a planning lawyer at Bracious and say, how can we resolve this? Because you want to help your client get the property, but you need to make sure that once they own the property, there's not any repercussions that could come back on them or could affect the value of the property. They need to make sure that there's good marketability for the property in the future. Yeah. I've, I've got to say, it's like with anything, when you get an expert on board, suddenly it feels like a real weight is lifted off your shoulders because they're, every day there are forms that confuse you, there are words that... You you've never heard before and everything when you're buying a property particularly sounds like it's the end of the, the deal it sounds like a deal breaker and then when someone like you comes on the phone or you meet up in the office and you say no what that is is this and you break it down <laughs> it's a really good feeling. Exactly. It's key to kind of clarify the client what you can do to help them. You know, we get that when you find a property, you just want to get into that property. You don't care about the legal work, but you have to understand that we're acting in your best interests and we need to make sure that the property is good for you to buy. Particularly if you're getting a mortgage, we've got to make sure that it's good value for the security, i.e. the mortgage that the lender is going to have secured on your property. So we just need to do that. But it's all about open communication with the client, making sure that they know what's going on, that what you're doing to progress things, if there is an issue, what you're doing to resolve that. Because very rarely there's nothing can't be over, overcome. You know, there is there are ways of getting through things. You might need to amend some documents or something like that, which could add time to the process. But very rarely is it a case that, OK, you can't proceed. No. 
some of the words you you used even describing there. I mean, when you see them in black and white, it's, it almost makes your blood run cold. Uh, but then when someone like you comes on the line, it just uh, makes life whew, uh, livable again. Um, what legal checks and searches are typically conducted by a conveyancer during the property transaction? So uh, you were talking about searches. What are we searching for? What are we looking for? Who's getting involved legally? Well, firstly, we're looking at the title. That's what's registered at the land registry for the property. So as a conveyancer, we would check the legal title, make sure that there's nothing untoward there. But if you're buying, we do carry out additional searches. So we would do a search at the local authority. We would do a water and drainage search and we would do an environmental search. So the local authority really just checks the records that the local authority hold against the property. That will look at any planning history, any building regulation history. It will look at where the nearest public highway is in relation to the property, making sure there's no enforcement notices or any other compulsory purchase orders affecting the property. Um, it will also just check whether it's in a conservation area, whether the trees are protected by tree preservation orders. Just things that you might not think about that can have an impact on what you're going to be doing when you live at the property. Yeah. You know, there's a tree preservation order. You can't just cut down a tree. You have to get the consent from the local authority. So it's just advising the client about that. Yeah. Water and drainage search is really what it sounds like. We're just checking with the water board that you're connected to the main sewerage system. It's not on a private drainage system. Um, and also that you're connected to the main's water supply and whether it's served by a water meter, where the nearest sewer is, whether there's any public sewers that run within the boundary of your property as well. And the environmental search, it's checking about the past sort of land use of the property, making sure there's no contamination issues, no flooding issues, the property's not been affected by, you know, landslips or something like that. And what's reassuring is that when you read these things, you think, again, that's the end of it, but then you've done it before, there's nothing you haven't seen before, and there's almost nothing that isn't a problem that's solvable. I remember when we got a thing for radon gas, you think, what? Run, run, there's radon gas. But then you sat down and you describe what radon gas is and how it combated and the problem and blah, blah, blah. And you think, phew, you're all right. And it's not some Hollywood movie I'm suddenly part of. Exactly. You realise that most properties are, are in that area where there's one to three percent of properties affected by radon gas. Etc. Yeah. The thing with environmental search is flooding. It might say it's at high risk of flooding, but when you look further, if it's a new build property, the developer might have put preventions in for flooding when they built the property. It's just really important just to do those searches. Again, if you're getting a mortgage, we've got to make sure we do those searches for the purposes of the lender, because if they have to take back the property, they need to know they can sell it on. So that's why we're obligated to carry out these searches. And again, for the sake of four or £500, why wouldn't you have searches done? No, absolutely. Are there any potential pitfalls, red flags that the buyer should be aware of during the conveyancing process. It sounds like you've kind of got, uh, well, you've got the expertise and the experience to get past most things, but what is almost insurmountable? What is a really, like, a big thing that really panics people? The time it takes sometimes, you've got to remember that the documentation that is filled in needs to be complete and needs to be signed. And even something like a simple signature missing can cause delays. So do just make sure that you fill paperwork in correctly, you double check it and make sure the answers are correct as well. Because if you're selling a property and you've put something in the property information form, you are legally responsible to make sure that information is correct. And if it's found out that it wasn't, then your buyer could have recourse you know, against you at a later date. Um, chains do break. That's so frustrating. We get that as conveyances that somebody in the chain could fall fall out because they've lost their job or they've had a change of heart or personal circumstances. And that can cause huge delays. Um, you may be lucky and you may have the chain that say, OK, let's wait until we get a new buyer on board. But sometimes you might lose a property. And if you've put money into it for searches and you've invested into a survey, that can be so frustrating. But it does happen. But I think it's important to just remember, as I said to you, that, you know, documentation can be changed. We can do things with the title. You can get indemnity insurance against a lot of things these days. So if there is some sort of defect, perhaps the seller had some work done 10 years ago, didn't get the relevant consent, you can get indemnity insurance to cover you. It's not going to cover you for the type of work they did, but it will cover you for any enforcement action that the local authority might take. So there are ways of getting past things. Okay, so the red flags aren't red flags permanently. You can uh, make them green flags after a, a little bit of work. We like to try and think we can, yeah, definitely. So next up, how does a conveyancer handle the transfer of property titles 
and ensure that the transaction and everything else is legally binding. Legally binding, there's a phrase to make your blood run cold. Um, how do you do all that? So this comes down to two key stages, exchange of contracts and completion. So exchange of contracts is once the conveyance has done all the checks, they've done the report to you, everything is signed up. At that point, they will say to you, right, we are ready to exchange contracts. We will do that on the telephone with the other conveyancer. We will run through the contract. We will put in the date of completion. The buyer will pay 10% deposit of the purchase price, put that down on exchange. That then becomes a legally binding contract for both the seller and the buyer. You are committed to completing on that property. Um, if you don't complete after that date, there's going to be serious financial repercussions. So as a conveyancer, we always like to get authority from the client, make sure that you are happy with your financial ability to proceed with the transaction, and then we can exchange. And obviously, we need to set the completion date. So you will need to check with removal companies, make sure you've got enough time to get something booked in. Uh, we appreciate sort of this time of year, people are going on holiday and things like that. So you might find that some people want to complete quicker than others. But you have to agree a date with the whole chain because obviously on the day of completion, the whole chain will complete. So the money kind of passes down each conveyancer step by step. So everyone has to agree on the same date. If... Something, just to play devil's advocate, you said there'd be financial penalties. I mean, what kind of penalties are you talking? Because obviously there's a lot waiting on it. Everyone's waiting in the chain. But what can you kind of expect penalty-wise? Well, as a buyer, once you've put that 10% deposit down, if you then didn't complete, you will lose that 10% deposit. So if you're buying for 300000 you've lost £30,000. The seller's entitled to keep that deposit. There's also a possibility that they could sue you for damages, um, it, it, it's just really tricky. I mean, you, just as I said, as a solicitor or a conveyancer, you really want to make sure that you are committed to going through with that transaction. It, it's not something you want to do lightly. If you think, actually, I'm not too sure, don't do it. If you've got any doubts, speak to your conveyancer before they commit you to that exchange of contracts. And now I've asked a question that's going to scare everyone. Let me just ask, and this I'm sure will now make everyone go, Phew, how often does that actually happen? Very rarely. Very rarely. That You'd be pleased to hear. The correct answer. <laughs> so are there any specific considerations or additional steps involved in the conveyancing process for different types of properties? Because you've got leasehold, there's new builds, shared ownership. They've all got their own thing going on. So what, what differences are there? What specific things do people need to know about? So yeah, until now, we've probably been talking about freehold properties, which are probably the simplest type of conveyancing transaction. But yes, there are additional properties, leasehold properties. So that's when a conveyancer is going to have to find some more information out. So a leasehold property is when you are basically buying the right to occupy the building. Somebody else will own the land that the building is on, but you are purchasing a leasehold interest, which is the right to occupy it. Um, and there will be something called a lease, which will detail all those terms of your occupation. It will include how much ground rent you pay, how much service charges you pay, who's responsible for insurance, repair, maintenance, etc. of the building. So as a conveyancer, we will want to see that lease. We will want to check that lease, make sure that it's got no um, onerous provisions or anything else like that. We also need to raise inquiries with the landlord. There may be a separate management company. There may even be managing agents that are hired on behalf of the landlord or the management company. We need them to provide a comprehensive history about the the leasehold mechanics relating to that property. So that would include whether any major repairs are due. If so, have the costs been paid or are they due to be paid? Um, again, has rent been paid up to date? Is there any arrears of rent? Service charges, are they likely to go up in the next couple of years? Because buying a leasehold property is very different to a freehold property. So you do need to make sure that you get all this additional information from all the parties involved. Um, Shared ownership is similar to leasehold. Shared ownership is where you buy a share of the property. So it could be from 10% up to 75%. You buy that, but then you rent the balance from a landlord. So if you bought 50%, you would then rent the remaining 50% from the landlord. So again, additional parties involved, more inquiries need to be raised. And again, a new build property... There's a lot of things that can go wrong with a new build property. There's issues with planning. Perhaps the developers not complied with all the planning permissions, so we would want to check that. Um, structural warranties. If you're buying a new build, you should get a structural warranty for the property. So again, we need to check that's in place. 
Um, if you think about developments, estates, there's the roads, there's the sewers that need to be thought about. So we need to make sure that all the paperwork's in place for those. Common parts, you might have to contribute towards a common part of the development. Is that all set up correctly? So you need to be careful that you get a conveyancer that knows what they're doing because shared ownership, leaseholds, new builds, they are very specific and you don't want somebody who doesn't know what they're doing doing that work on your behalf. But I would just say, bear in mind that you probably will pay more for that legal service because of the additional work that's involved for the conveyancer to undertake on your behalf. I remember moving into a flat and they there was all this bump come through and there was a thing about peppercorn rent. And I was like, Pepper, peppercorn rent? What is this, the Middle Ages? What, what's, what's peppercorn rent? Uh, so even even those little things that pop up that you've never heard before, just, just for the record, peppercorn rent? Means nothing, but it means that if a landlord did demand it, you would pay a peppercorn. Yeah, which is literally, literally from literally. the olden days, a peppercorn. So uh, in that box that you pack, that you're going to unpack first, it's got your kettle in it, make sure you've also got your peppercorn in there just in case. How can a conveyancer then assist with resolving any of the issues that might arise during the property transaction? You kind of mentioned boundaries and planning permissions and stuff like that. How do you get involved and solve those problems? Well, as soon as uh, an issue is flagged up, you know, I'm really lucky at Bracers. We've got a wealth of experience with other teams. So if I found that there was a boundary issue with a property that my client was purchasing, I would speak to my property litigation team and say, OK, can I get your advice as to what you think the best thing is to do to move forward with that? Again, if there's a planning issue, you want to speak to a planning solicitor to get the best advice that you can. Again, it's just about open communication with the client, letting them know if there's an issue that's arisen, what you're doing to address that um the sooner you do it the better it is for the client because you can reassure them that it's in hand you're dealing with it rather than sort of not communicating with your client and they start panicking you know we get that moving house is stressful um even if it goes through really easily it's still stressful but with these other things on top it can make it even worse and frustrating for you and you're spending a lot of money on something so it's just open communication with the client Ask Our Expert. All right, well, that brings us to our Ask Our Expert. That's you, Sarah. It's been sent in by one of our listeners. Does a conveyancer give a breakdown of all costs associated with a transaction? So do we get like a bit of a balance sheet? Do we have an idea of what we're going to be spending from the off? Absolutely. As conveyancers, we are required to provide you with transparent pricing, which means that you get a clear, comprehensive breakdown of all costs and fees that are associated with your transaction. We have to openly disclose that pricing structure, including the legal fees and disbursements and any additional charges that might arise. Most firms do, but at Abrasures, we have a quote system on our website. So you can go in, you can put in the details of what you're buying or selling, how much, what type of property it is. And you will then get a bespoke quote tailored to your transaction, which gives you a full breakdown of those costs. You know, it will include everything, the stamp duty land tax, if you're buying, how much you've got to pay for that, the land registration fee. And also it's spoke to the searches. So if we know the address of the property, we can give you an exact figure for the cost of those searches that you're going to have to pay at that time. With all the things that you look into, it's amazing how they become, as a buyer or a seller or both, it's, it's overwhelming. And that's what you're there for. It's just a, a hand to hold. It's, it's so important going through what is such a tough, tough thing. There's so much that changes as well to keep on top of. I mean, just flicking through a news feed, you see things that are changing all the time. You think, I wonder if that affects me. So here we are halfway through as we record 2023. What recent things are changing in the laws that are going to affect things? What, what do we need to be on top of as a, you know, a customer, a client? So leasehold properties are really going through a major shake-up at the moment. Um, the Building Safety Act 2022 came in last year, and that was in response to the Grenfell fire tragedy in 2017. And that's providing protection for leaseholders to make sure that they're not responsible for paying for any historical building safety defects. There are qualifying criteria and generally building owners of higher rise buildings will be required to register their building with the building safety regulator, undertake regular safety inspections, demonstrate compliance with general building standards. 
if anybody is looking to purchase a leasehold property that's caught by the Act, there are a lot of qualifying criteria that you need to be aware of. And at the moment, unfortunately, there's not clear guidance to us as conveyances as to what mortgage lenders want. And even the Law Society has not issued any guidance. So you might find with leasehold properties that there are some conveyances that won't help you purchase one if it's over a certain height because it's just going through such a turmoil at the moment. So it's sort of in the next six months to a year, things will calm down, guidance will come out to conveyances. But just, yeah, if you're buying or selling a leasehold property, be aware of that. And if you do have a property that's affected by that act, you may find that you're going to pay a lot more in legal fees because there's a lot more work involved for a conveyancer for those types of properties. Would your advice ever be in those kind of situations where everything's in flux and no one really knows where it's going to go? Is your advice ever... Wait. I mean, I know it's it's often about speed, but is, is do you ever say, look, now is not a good time, essentially? We have done with leasehold properties. If you don't need to sell, then we would say with properties that are over 11 metres, which are caught by the Act, if you don't need to sell, just wait for 12 months, 18 months. Let the legislation sort itself out because... You know, the government put this legislation in, absolutely, it needed to be done following, you know, the tragedy of Grenfell, but the legislation was rushed through, there are holes in the legislation, and they're asking conveyances to verify information that we just can't do at the moment. So we would certainly say, higher rise buildings, if you don't need to sell, sit tight, rent it out if you can for 12 to 18 months, and then let's see what happens in the near future. So obviously, don't forget... It's always a good idea to consult with a financial advisor, solicitor or estate agent or all of those uh, to help you navigate the home buying process and answer any additional questions you might have. Thanks again to our special guest, Sarah Smith. Thank you, Sarah, very much indeed. Uh, Partner, solicitor at Bracers LLP for sharing all her knowledge today and your expertise with all our listeners. You can check out all our previous episodes at im Listening. .co.uk. And don't forget to check out the Property Podcast with Wards next month. See you then. Make sure you hit the subscribe button. Thanks for listening to the Property Podcast with Wards. If you'd like more information on the subjects that we've covered in today's episode, just head over to the Wards website at wardsofkent.co.uk or you can follow us on our social media channels. You can check out our latest episodes at www.im-listening.co.uk or wherever you listen to your podcasts. This has been an I Am Listening original podcast. For more information, head over to our website, im-listening.co.uk.